All right, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Arun Vamori with the DH of Science and Technology Directorate's uh, Biometric and Identity Technology Center. Uh, I'd like to join and thank you for uh, joining us today for this webinar on evaluating the equitability of commercial facial recognition technologies in DHS scenarios. Uh, this is part of our webinar series where we are providing better, um, you know, providing information about some of the work we're doing, specifically in the area of assessing the accuracy, uh, fairness, and equitability of biometric technologies and, and matching algorithms. So with that, uh, I'd like to also let you know that we're joined by two of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Yevgeny Sotorodin and uh, Dr. John Howard, who will be briefing uh, you today on some of the work that we're doing. Uh, let's go ahead to the next slide, please. All right, we'll provide you a quick uh, overview of some of the things that we're going to be talking about today. We'll provide you an introduction to the Biometric and Identity Technology Center, uh, talk about the biometric technology rallies and how that data collection and that activity uh, leads to data and helps inform some of our research, test and evaluation activities, and the work that we're doing on standards uh, to help uh, inform broad international engagement on measuring the effectiveness of these technologies, not only in terms of raw biometric performance, but also, again, fairness and equitability. Uh, and we'll go also go talk about some of the work that we've been doing in 2021 with our most recent biometric technology rally uh, to help take a look at how industry has progressed over the last year. Uh, next slide. All right. Uh, so within the U.S. and within s and uh, you know, Technology Centers Division, we have the Biometric and Identity Technology Center. And what we do is core foundational research uh, into topics related to biometrics and digital identity. Our goal is to help drive innovation throughout s and and the DHS components and, and headquarters, op comp headquarters agencies uh, through research, development, test, and evaluation. Uh, our we, we, our intention is to help facilitate better understanding, uh, lessons learned, and, and help people understand how, sorry about that, how technologies are continuing to evolve um, and, and where, and provide greater transparency and understanding for DHS components who are trying to keep, a, have a better understanding of how they, these technologies may be useful for their specific operations. Our goal is also to help drive efficiencies. If we find that technologies are working well for some components or that there are best practices to be to, to be shared, uh, it's our intention to help make sure that that knowledge is shared across different components and missions. Uh, we provide objective subject matter expertise across the enterprise, uh, not just one component or mission, but make sure that that's broadly available. And we work actively with industry and academia to provide uh, not only a better understanding of where we have technology needs and gaps, but also to spur innovation and to help uh, you know, provide mechanisms to evaluate, and provide feedback so that they can make better technologies over time. And with that, uh, let's go on to the next slide. I'll kick it over to Dr. Sorotin, who will provide a background on the Biometric and Identity Technology Center uh, technology rallies and talk a little bit more about how that feeds some of our uh, supporting research. Thank you. Thanks, Varun. DHS s and created the Biometric Technology Rallies to motivate industry to provide innovative biometric technology solutions focused on DHS technology use cases. Specifically, the rallies were designed to address key technology risks outlined on the left. We believe these risks are relevant across a variety of biometric technology use cases, many of which will be discussed uh, at this webinar. These risks include effectiveness risks or high failure rates, efficiency risks or technologies that are too slow or require excessive staff, uh, risks to the satisfaction of, of the users of the technology, um, leading to potentially low adoption or just unhappy users, um, and of course, risks to privacy, uh, whether PII gathered by these systems is stored securely. Um, and each biometric technology rally is carefully designed to focus on a specific biometric technology use case. Um, oh, and I forgot, of course, the subject of this webinar is the equitability risk, which focuses on ensuring technology works for ev everyone. So each biometric technology rally is carefully designed to focus on a specific biometric technology use case 
and provides independent quantitative assessment of current industry offerings. Um, and the rally has really helped DHS collaborate with industry, uh, and they do that through cooperative research and development agreements, which are entered into between DHS and technology providers so that they can uh, share information and make their technologies work better uh, within the DHS scenario. Um, going on to the next slide, we see that here is a little bit of a primer on scenario testing versus technology testing. So the biometric technology rallies are specifically scenario tests, and as such, they fill a specific need in testing biometric technologies that's kind of unique. Scenario tests are laboratory evaluations that fall in between sort of the operational testing that you like pilot deployments on one side and technology tests um, that are that are done in computer labs on the other. And so what I'd like to do is highlight the difference between technology tests like, for example, NIST's FRVT tests that folks are familiar with and scenario testing like the biometric technology rallies. So technology testing focuses on a specific biometric technology component, for example, a matching algorithm uh, in isolation, whereas scenario tests, on the other hand, are centered around a specific technology use case, uh, for instance, uh, a high throughput uh, airport checkpoint. And they include uh, the full multi-component biometric system. So everything from uh, user interaction, camera lo location, and, um, and of course, biometric matching algorithms. So technology tests generally reuse uh, biometric data sets and images that have been collected in the past, and they benefit from these larger sample sizes, where scenario testing, by contrast, gathers all new biometric data each time in a way that simulates the operational environment, but consequently we work with smaller sample sizes in this case. So what's important here though, is technology testing answers different questions than scenario testing. So technology testing answers questions about how technologies advance or perform relative to each other, especially at the limits of performance. So sort of think racing cars along the Bonneville salt flats, you know, the kind of cars that that people race there to see who can um, beat the world land speed record uh, are very different than the kind of cars you drive around town. Uh, so scenario testing answers questions about how well the technology performs within an intended use case. And this, in this case, you could think of, you know, if you're driving your car around town versus along a dirt trail versus some other specific scenario where you need to get from point A to point B. So the scenario test is really tailored to answering questions around that track and not in principle. So technology tests, testing also answers questions like, what's the, for biometrics, like what is the minimum false match rate achievable by face recognition technology? Whereas scenario testing answers questions like, how will face recognition perform in say a high throughput unattended scenario, like at an airport? So the work we perform at the Maryland Test Facility involves um, testing different types of biometric technologies, which include, of course, face recognition. And the main test we perform, uh, the rally, is focused on assessing a, a multitude of commercial face recognition and multimodal system in DHS use cases. So we've been running the rally since 2018, and the most recent assessment was carried out just a few months ago. Um, to date, We've tested more than 200 combinations of commercial face acquisition systems and matching algorithms in this high throughput unattended use case that we've been simulating for these years. Uh, and these rallies have provided some really comprehensive metrics about these tested technologies, which include you know, how quickly they work, their efficiency and transaction times, the effectiveness of these te technologies, uh, you know, the uh, ability of them to reliably acquire images and match them, uh, a satisfaction, you know, the user feedback that people leave about these technologies, as well as more recently, and the focus of the 2021 rally is the equitability, uh, making sure the technology works well for different demographic groups. And a lot of this work you could find at mdtf.org. So in addition to the summative metrics of technology performance, DHS ST has used the data gathered as part of the rallies to help answer important questions about the way that commercial biometric technologies work, including questions regarding whether technology is equitable, fair, or biased through advanced data analyses and publications in scientific journals. And I have a few of them on the right side of the slide here. Um, 
And, and our publications to date have addressed a number of research topics, which include, for example, looking at the role of image acquisition in shaping demographic differences in face recognition system performance, establishing the influence of race, gender, and age on the false match rates, estimates of face recognition systems, something we'll touch on today, quantification and comparison of race and gender differences in commercial face and iris recognition system, uh, as well as cognitive biases introduced by face recognition algorithm outcomes um, in human workflows. So while some systems test well with diverse demographic groups, um, there are some demographic performance differentials that persist in both acquisition and in matching components of biometric systems, and these require careful evaluation. So I'll give you some examples today, uh, and so will John uh, later on in this webinar. So specifically, what I'll start with is data from last year's, the 2020 Biometric Technology Rally, which was the first rally completed during the ongoing COVID-19 national emergency. Um, so as the emergency unfolded from February into the fall of 2020, masks became a part of life in the travel environment. Uh, and removing masks for face recognition um, now became a potential new source of risk to unvaccinated travelers and to staff at the airport. So for the 2020 rally, um, we challenged industry to provide face recognition technologies that work in the presence of face masks. And this rally was the first large scale scenario test of such technologies. And they com we compared how well they worked for individuals without masks and the same people wearing their face masks of choice using the technology. And all this while simulated a high throughput unattended scenario environment. So what do I mean when I say an unattended high throughput scenario? And I think I alluded to this a few times before, kind of like an airport checkpoint. But here's what the main properties of this scenario. One, the face recognition system had a limited time to operate. We actually just eight seconds on average per person. Um, the face recognition system uh, gets to acquire just about one image per individual. You can't acquire, you know, 10. Um, and the identification gallery that you're working with is small. You know, typically you want to identify people boarding a particular aircraft, uh, 500 people. Most people being matched are in the identification gallery as well, so there's very few people that would be um, out of gallery in this case, people who are not on the plane. And uh, consequently, the impact of errors of those being matched is dominated by one kind of error. It's called a false negative error or false non-match. Um, and the impact, the consequence of having a false non-match is a delay or a denial of access to an aircraft. So in, in, in this case, that's what I'm going to focus on. In the later part of the talk, uh, Dr. Howard will talk about the other type of biometric error. So on, in this rally, the 2020 rally, a total of 582 diverse volunteers participated. And I show you a sort of a demographic breakdown here by age, race, and gender. Um, it's a complex graphic, but what it conveys is that we had people uh, that participated in this rally come from all sorts of demographic backgrounds, all ages 18 um, to 65, uh, males, females, and, and folks from different uh, race groups. Um, every, all of this demographic data is self-identified by the volunteers. So there were um, some volunteers that self-identified as Black or African American, volunteers that self-identified as white, Asian, and you know a number of other groups for whom we had a limited sample. Um, throughout the testing, volunteers used their own personal face masks. Um, and in this rally, six commercial uh, image acquisition systems participated and 10 commercial matching systems participated uh, for a total of 60 com system combinations tested. You see the rally, in the rally, we test uh, um, different acquisition systems with different matching systems and we're able to see a whole variety of, uh, of performance. So all of these systems had to acquire face image from each volunteer, and then that face image was used to identify each volunteer uh, against a small gallery. And so what did we see? So the first part of the rally tested these systems without face masks. Uh, so everybody wear, was wearing their face mask, but right before biometric acquisition, we asked them to take their mask off 
so that you could go through the biometric system. And the infographic that I have here on the left shows the overall performance of the median system um, without face masks. So, so the median system actually did quite well because face recognition has come a long way in the last decade. And the graphic on the left shows that overall the median system was able to identify 93% of these 582 volunteers. Um, so overall, you can see there were few errors due to matching. Just 1% of the errors were due to uh, the matching system failing to identify based on a collected photo. Um, but more numerous were issues uh, with image acquisition, so the, where the camera failed to take a photo. That was for 6% of the um, individuals in our sample. Uh, so overall, this is well in line with what we typically see in these scenario tests is that actually algorithms have gotten very accurate and they now don't dominate the errors of the biometric system. A lot of the errors are now made by, by the cameras. Um, and on the right, I'm showing you uh, something that's uh, that we call the disaggregated performance of these system across demographic groups. So on the x-axis, I have the different demographic groups, black, white, Asian, and other. Um, and uh, each point on this graph represents the true identification rate for a given system combination, there are eight, 60 total, across our sample for each one of the demographic groups. And you could see that this true identification rate is very high uh, for each one of the uh, systems tested. So for any system tested, I could find, uh, for any demographic group tested, I could find a number of systems, and that's the number above these colored plots, a number of systems that have performed, you know, at uh, acceptable range, within acceptable range, and that's that gray bar on the graph. So you could see 22 systems performed well within the acceptable range for uh, volunteers that identified as black or African-American, 32 systems for volunteers that self-identified as white, 25 systems for those that self-identified as Asians, and 12 is for other. Um, and, and, and this tier is actually inclusive of all the sources of errors, so failures to acquire and failures to match. And on the right, very right side, I have another type of tier, which we call matching tier. And that one just focuses on algorithm errors. And you can see that when you take away errors of acquisition, essentially all the, um, all the systems uh, were able to, you, you know, most of the systems were able to meet uh, this high performance bar across demographic groups. And of course, there are some systems that just didn't perform very well for technical reasons. Um, and those are the dots that you see at the very bottom. But overall, the results look very similar across demographic groups. So what happens when we, um, when we had folks keep wearing their face masks? Um, so obviously, a lot of these biometric systems were redesigned very recently in order to be able to even handle images with face masks. So we asked, OK, well, what impact now does that have on the performance of face recognition? And just to give you a, 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 an idea, these images here are the diversity of the kind of images gathered by our system, the diversity of the face masks that we had in this evaluation. You could see all sorts of masks here. You could see blue surgical masks. You could see a lot of personal masks, masks with patterns, masks that are dark or light, different colors and, and, and different patterns as well. So this was really a good representative variety of the kind of face masks uh, that people wear uh, within this uh, the travel environment. So what did things look like? So again, on the left, I'm showing the performance of the median system. Um, and indeed, the performance with face masks was lower with the median system now identifying only 77 of the 500, 77 percent of the 582 volunteers. Remember the previous slide, it was 93 percent. But impressively, the best system combination was still able to identify 96% of all volunteers. Um, again, you know, now the errors uh, were a little bit higher, so the algorithm failed to identify 8% in the median system, and the camera failed to take a photo on 14% for the median system. So again, a lot of problems with even acquiring an image, and they're exacerbated by face masks. But what I'm showing you on the on the right is again this disaggregated performance. I'm showing you this true identification rate. Um, and now I have an arrow marking an observation that we found uh, uh, worth the highlighting is when we disaggregated the system performance in the presence of masks, the result looks very different. So of course, overall performance went down, 
but performance for some demographic groups went down more than for others. So for instance, the performance for individuals that self-identified as Black or African American um, was particularly lowered such that now no system combination uh, achieved acceptable performance as Ray-Band for that demographic group. Whereas for white, you see that five systems met that criteria for Asian 15 and then for other eight. Um, and, and you could see that this persists even if you take discount any failures to acquire. So on the very right, it's the same plot, but now on the matching tier, fewer systems met the matching only criteria, um, you know, seven versus uh, above uh, 26 for all other groups, um, seven, seven for black or African Americans. So, so what this shows is that face masks not only decrease face recognition performance overall, but they also unmask some demographic differentials, which we didn't see uh, when, when the faces were not masked, when people were taking their masks off. So let's look at the performance of this best performing acquisition matching system combination, which performed you know, relatively well, as, we, uh, as I said earlier. Um, and you can see that without masks, this system actually matched every single person. It, it didn't make matching errors. Um, so the best system combination really worked well for everyone. And you can see that without masks on the left. But with masks on the right, you could see that even this best system combination failed to reach 95% true identification rate for volunteers identifying as Black or African American. So, so th this sort of sets the upper bound of what was possible uh, as demonstrated by this rally. So what have I told you um, so far? Uh, well, uh, face recognition technology can work well across demographic groups, especially without face masks. And these findings are similar to the findings from past rally scenario tests. But acquisition and matching errors don't always increase equally when the system is perturbed, in this case, by the addition of face masks. So if a system were to be evaluated for demographic differentials um, without face masks, you'd say that most of these systems did pretty well. Um, however, as, as conditions change, like when people start wearing face masks, then um, this, uh, uh, these perturbations can actually unmask some demographic differentials that exist in the systems that just aren't visible without. Um, so we found that this performance could decline for some demographic groups more than for others. Both acquisition and matching performance was affected. It's not just the matching algorithm that's important. Uh, we believe that there's a lot of effects of acquisition cameras on, uh, uh, that contribute to this. And that future research is going to be really needed to investigate differential performance of the technology that underlies these differential outcomes. So the takeaway here is a fair system under one set of operational conditions may become a little bit demographically unfair when conditions change. And so from this, we recommend ongoing testing uh, to track system performance uh, and to include fairness as part of that uh, as conditions change. So at this point, um, I'm going to hand things off to my colleague, Dr. John Howard, uh, who's going to talk about the other kind of biometric error. So everything I've told you so far has been about false negatives. Uh, and what John is going to talk about right now is a different kind of error, false positives, which has a different kind of demographic effects. And John, I'm going to hand it off to you now. Okay, um, just a head nod from someone you can hear me. This is good. Excellent. Okay, so um, yeah, biometrics and uh, what we call demographic equitability. This is a topic that we found ourselves um, very heavily involved in in sort of the last uh, couple of years. And it sort of means, you know, how do biometric systems work across different groups of people, right? And this can be a lot of different things. It could be white, black, it could be short, tall, it could be light skinned, dark skinned, it could be male, female. Um, but one of our goals is to sort of evaluate and, and to encourage uh, industry to make biometric systems that sort of work equally well uh, for all these different groups of people. And so that's what this topic we're going to look at today is. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Right. Uh, so this may be a topic that some of you are familiar with. It's actually been uh, in the news a lot lately over the last couple of years and in some you know fairly prominent 
uh, places. We had articles in, in places like Nature that you see there in the upper left, uh, that which is you know a leading scientific publication that sort of asked the question: Is facial recognition too biased to be let loose? Uh, we had some material in, in uh, MIT Technology Review, another very, very prominent tech reporting uh, outlet that said, um, you know, a U.S. government study actually confirmed uh, in their words that face recognition systems were racist. Uh, and then the other thing I'll point out on this slide is it's not just a U.S. issue. Uh, there's been a lot of activity uh, in Europe, and especially with regulatory bodies asking, you know, do we need to ban uh, these technologies? And then uh, the quote I'll point out in the lower uh, right there is that the reason that they these technologies are sometimes seen as discriminatory is because of this clustering effect that they cluster individuals by these demographic groups, whether that's race, ethnicity, gender, et cetera. Uh, so we wanted to sort of ask the question, you know, what does that mean for commercial face recognition to cluster people by those demographic categories? And if you go to the next slide, uh, we can kind of see visually what that looks like. So a little context here, when people come to the Maryland test facility, we take a picture of their iris patterns and a picture of their face. And we ask, our, ask ourselves, have we ever seen this person before? And that's because we want to have really good ground truth information about who the people that were, are involved in our testing are, right? Because the biometric error rates that we evaluate these systems on are sort of based on that ground truth information. And what we found uh, is that sometimes the computer systems we use to do this think that person has been there before and when that happens they'll send us back a picture of who they think it is and so what you see on the left here is our people who experience this false match uh, behavior that's what that's called uh, with their iris pattern and what you see on the right is people that uh, had that false match error occur with their face pattern and you should notice uh, something that's rather profound it's that all of the uh, um, iris recognition false matches are not sort of related demographically, right? They're not the same gender, the same race, or the same age. But the same can't be said for the face recognition false matches. Every single person you see sort of on the right-hand side there, more or less, they're all the same gender, they're mostly the same race, and they're more or less the same age as well. And, and that's a characteristic sort of unique to facial recognition. It doesn't happen with iris recognition, and it doesn't happen with fingerprint recognition. And that's something we sort of observed while we were watching these systems operate in real time with face recognition specifically. Uh, next slide. Um, so most people watching this, that's probably not surprising that face recognition does that. Um, if you were you know, a computer scientist or someone that was evaluating a face recognition algorithm, I showed you the last slide, you'd probably think that's a working face recognition algorithm. That's what it's supposed to do. And, and I'll challenge you to sort of understand I think the reason most people think that is because unlike iris recognition humans do face recognition as well right we have brains that have evolved to do uh, face recognition it's important for a number of reasons for evolutionary speaking we recognize mates friends foes um, and we study this in sort of neuroscientists and human cognition uh, so much to the point that we actually know the part of the brain that does uh, human face recognition it's the part you see sort of highlighted uh, in the red here. Um, and so to us, it's intuitive that a computer algorithm would also think people that share, you know, gender and race are more similar. But um, we think that sort of gives us uh, sort of an unconscious bias when it comes to humans evaluating, you know, how well the face recognition algorithms work. We think they should work like that. So when they are, it's not surprising to us. And it's sort of our uh, claim here that we need to overcome that human intuition so that we really can objectively evaluate these technologies. Uh, next slide. OK, so this is kind of mathematically what that clustering looks like. I showed you just visually what it looks like. But uh, the chart you see here in the middle, you can sort of picture every row and every column is a different person. And the value in the cell is how well or how similar a face recognition algorithm thought those two people were. So a couple of things you should notice looking at this sort of matrix here is that the diagonal is all very dark and that's because face recognition algorithms think uh, two of the exact same images are look very similar, right? Again, working. And the other thing you should notice is sort of this block diagonal pattern that moves um, along the sort of middle of the chart. 
And that's because, again, face recognition algorithms tend to think uh, black females look more similar to other black females than white females do to black females, which is sort of this these two blocks you see along the bottom row there. Uh, and that same effect exists for other demographic groups as well. The face recognition algorithms tend to think white females look more similar to white females, black males look more similar to black males, white males, etc. Uh, it's not limited to just one of those groups. Uh, next slide. Uh, so that sort of block diagonal pattern there that exists, uh, it can be problematic, right? It, it has this effect that I just sort of outlined. And so we wanted to ask ourselves, you know, do we think it's possible to make a face recognition algorithm that doesn't do this, that behaves more like uh, a fingerprint or iris recognition algorithm, where if you took my uh, fingerprints or my iris patterns and you searched me against a whole gallery of people, the person that comes back most similar to me is not going to be in all likelihood another 30-year-old Caucasian male. Uh, and so we asked ourselves, do we think it's possible to tra train a face recognition algorithm to do something similar to that, where it's just as likely to confuse me for, you know, perhaps a nine-year-old Asian woman as it is a 30-year-old Caucasian male? And it turns out we think the answer to that is really yes. Um, so that would be moving from uh, the sort of matrix pattern you see in the middle to the pattern you see on the upper right there, where there really is no discernible pattern along the middle. Uh, I'm not going to go into sort of all of the uh, math behind how we did this. It's it's kind of a lot for this short uh, kind of presentation. I will say we published um, a paper. It's actually a DHS uh, technical paper series. It's on the uh, Biometric and Identity Technology Center website right now, where all that's laid out. Um, I encourage you, guys, if anyone's interested, to go download that and go through it. I'm also happy to take questions on it in the Q&A, but it essentially comes to these conclusions that are laid out on the slide here. Uh, that we can prevent face recognition algorithms from taking into account race and gender information when they're making identity determinations. Uh, and it'll still be a functioning face recognition algorithm. It won't, it'll still distinguish people uh, from themselves and from other people. Uh, there's also a conclusion in the uh, paper that this technique might, could, lead to slightly less accurate face recognition algorithms overall, uh, but algorithms that lead to more fair outcomes, which we sort of point out is a, a trade space that's worth exploring and a, and a conversation that's worth happening. Uh, so yeah, I encourage everyone to go uh, on the to the Tech Center website and, and look at that if you're interested. Next slide. Um, so right, as part of this demographic work that I just outlined that we've been doing, we're also heavily involved in the international standards community. I mentioned this isn't sort of just a problem that's unique to US. Um, a lot of our nations are having it as well. Go to the slide. <coughs> uh, and that's because a lot of people are sort of starting to use face recognition systems. It's seen a sort of uh, an explosion in use cases over the last couple of years. Uh, with that explosion in use cases has come, we think, a sort of an increased public awareness um, and also some concerns. Um, this has trickled also into the policymaker space. I've got two uh, U.S. Senate bills listed here on the slide, uh, 3284 and 4084, that are both um, essentially regulation or restrictions on the use of face recognition specifically. Uh, there's similar actions pending uh, both in Australia and in the EU, probably elsewhere that I don't even have listed on this chart. Um, and I think some of that stems from, uh, you know, researchers don't always talk about this the same way as well. And so part of this international standards effort uh, that DHS has really taken a leadership role and is sort of coming to that standard. Uh, next slide. Uh, it started actually a few years ago. This is a, a ISO technical report 22116 uh, that DHS would actually uh, consume the editorship on. Um, it was the first to sort of think about how would we do um, studies of demographic uh, equitability on sort of the international stage. It defined some terms sort of looked at different areas in the system where performance variation can exist. That was actually published almost a whole year ago now. Um, and that led into some activities that we're currently uh, undertaking. If you go to the next slide, uh, which is the actual international standard. This is uh, ISO document 19795-10, and it is how to quantify uh, biometric performance across the demographic groups. Um, it was approved shortly after that TR was released. They sort of looked at it 
and said this is a worthwhile topic and we've got the starts of what could be an international standard here. We should just put out the first draft of that. Uh, you have Guinea and I are actually the co-editors of it. Um, the first draft came out this summer. The final international should be uh, approved for publication sometime in the 2023 to 2024 timeline. Uh, but that means it's sort of open right now for uh, um, comment and for uh, new material and things like that. And DHS, uh, as well as some other um, U.S. government agencies, have really taken that opportunity to add material uh, into the standard, which we think is a, a really good thing. And through some of this material, I think we only have a couple slides left, and then wait to the Q&A session. Um, so this is what's within scope of that ISO standard. Um, essentially, what the title says, uh, how to estimate and report on performance variation across demographic groups. Uh, that gives some the document attempts to give some guidance on establishing demographic group membership that's sometimes challenging particularly when we talk about things like race categories across international countries um, guidance on using what's called phenotypic measures which are more observable as opposed to reportable reported characteristics of uh, individuals i think that's a good thing uh, it does what PR did as well, which is continue to define these terms and definitions. So when we say things like demographic differential, we're all talking about the same thing. And then it gives uh, some requirements on sort of, again, from a math level, how do you do these tests? What kind of statistical techniques do you use? What kind of formulas and things like that? All of that's sort of currently being iterated on. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then this is sort of the last part of the scope. And I'm, I'm bringing this up just because uh, I think some of the people on the call, this may be interesting to you. And if it is, I, I highly encourage you to reach out to Arun uh, and sort of get involved with the standard. We're always looking for additional partners to help craft this and, and to take input. Um, but so outside of the scope and the definitions that I went through on the last slide, I mentioned this phenotypical measures. And then the last two we think are really important, right? So it's how uh, and when do you do demographic testing? I think if Kenny laid out a really uh, compelling case study and why it's important to do these uh, fairly often, because as things change on the ground, the results of your demographic equitability study could change as well. And then, okay, so you've decided to do an equitability study what do you actually need to report out? What do you need to sort of tell people to give them the confidence that these systems are working equally well for all groups of people? Uh, that'll also be part of the standard. Uh, so next slide. Uh, okay, and I think we're gonna end here and just note that um, Gene talked about, or Yevgeny talked about the 2020 biometric technology rally that we did sort of mid pandemic. We actually just executed uh, another one a couple of months ago. Um, this was in October, uh, and this one is very similar to the uh, rally of getting talked about where we're looking at mass and non mass performance with these acquisition and matching systems. But for the first time, this uh, 2021 rally is also explicitly looking at biometric performance across uh, demographic groups. That hasn't been an explicit goal of us in the past. And part of the reason is because we didn't have sort of some of these ideas standardized about how that and so as the standard has progressed it's allowed us to migrate some of those uh, topics into our scenario testing model as well um, uh, reports uh, on how this went uh, will be coming out shortly and so i encourage everybody to check back with the room and with the tech center and, and uh, get the results of those studies uh, and with that i think that's my last slide we can uh, turn it back to a or open it up for questions uh, whatever you want to do okay i have a question in um when it's a question i'll read it off when you looked at iris matching did you have any mismatches of people across eye color types or were they of the same demographic groups of the same eye color i think maybe john you want to take this one yeah i can take this one this is actually it's a really good question actually so eye color we, you know, we mentioned uh, age race and gender as demographic groups that presumably would affect face recognition. Eye color is one we didn't bring up on this slide, uh, but that's one that might affect, you could reasonably presume uh, it would affect iris recognition. Um, I don't actually have an answer to the question because we didn't pull that particular piece of information, but I will just kind of mention that a te technical these iris recognition algorithms work is one, they're all looking at um, irises and it's called the near IR range, so outside of actual visible light. And so they sort of look like black and white images to begin with. Um, and then the second point is sort of the way that iris matching works. 
uh, uses these patterns called Kapoor wavelets. Uh, they're not really consistent between eye colors, so we wouldn't expect to find that there, but it's a, again a good question and something you could reasonably assume might happen with iris recognition. Yeah, I'll add one thing, uh, John, to, to, to this reply is that, you know, the choice of demographic groups um, is, is really important and it's something that I think the standard also, the Stash 10 standard that, that John mentioned it will address. But, you know, which demographic groups should we worry about assessing? Because, you know, ultimately you could you could imagine creating a demographic group of people who for whom the technology works better than for others. And, and that could be a demographic group on its own right. But we have these protected demographic groups in different jurisdictions. And those are really the ones that, that the, we've been focusing on so far. Um, but it's a, it's a great question because different technologies may have different demographic effects. Um, and, and I've got the next question here. Um, and, and this question is, uh, what are the confidence intervals on identification relative to the individual features used in the facial recognition algorithm for different demographics? And, and I think what the question is trying to ask is, is there a, um, is there a difference in the um, confidence scores maybe of the of the identifications based on different demographic groups or or the variability of the measured identification performance across demographic groups the charts that we had on the screen today uh, we did not put uh, error bars on those charts uh, so you could, our sample is typically numbering in the uh, I say for for folks identifying as black or African American we had a sample you know, in the hundreds uh, and, and for, for folks that self-identified as white as well. So those confidence intervals will typically be in the order of a, of a, of a few percent. And, and so, uh, so that addresses the question. And if not, I apologize and maybe I misunderstood it. Yeah, maybe just to, to add on here. Um, and again, please rephrase the question if that wasn't it. Um, pretty of guinea there but the general question about what is it how do you put confidence intervals on these numbers i think is actually a very uh, important one right so we usually report out things like false match rate false non-match rate and asking the question of how similar these things need to be to be sort of be determined as equal is a really challenging one in some situations and it's one of the things that also the standard attempts to go into um, to sort of give some guidance on you know okay so you have two different numbers from two different rates uh, is that, you know, can you say it's operating at statistically the same uh, rate for across those groups? Uh, really good question, really hard question actually to answer too. So, so uh, a clarification that came in with the question is, the clarification is the features used, iris, ears, nose, mouth, do the confidences associated with different facial features very differently for different demographics. And, and I think to answer that question is I would have to say that we simply um, we, we don't know these these face recognition algorithms are, are essentially black boxes. They take uh, the, at least the modern ones. They take the entire face image and they perform a, you know, a complex uh, you know, convolutional operations on this image so that we can't tell whether or not a particular specific feature is driving that score. But if you look at our technical paper, we're actually trying to unravel uh, at least what kind of what kind of features that these algorithms might be using that are related to demographics. So we, we can't pin it down to like, oh, it's the nose or it's the ears, but we can say that we have evidence that they're using some sort of a set of features that are linked with demographics because we see some patterns in the way that this algorithm performs across specific demographic groups. Um, so unfortunately, I can't I can't answer the question directly. Uh, John or Arun, do, do you have anything? Yeah, I'll just kind of add. I, so I had to drop off and come back on. But uh, I think you know one of the things that the points to make here too is uh, most of these modern technologies, we've seen this massive improvement with facial recognition algorithms in the last couple of years, largely driven by the adoption of AI ML technologies into this space. But with the adoption of the AIML, we don't exactly know what features 
these these models are using all the time. And we can try to go back and and dissect that a little bit, but we're limited because these are trained models from that are very commercial that are commercial and proprietary. Right. So there's on, only so much insight we can actually get into what's going on within the models themselves. Uh, so it's really hard to to pinpoint what are the features, let alone whether the features of, of that are more salient vary between different demographic groups. OK, uh, next question um, regarding the system that performed the best on un the on the unmasked faces. Is it possible that this system was using some ocular inputs? And, and I think the answer is yes. Um, I, I think uh, it's it certainly again, as, as Arun pointed out, these are these are sort of black box systems and, and we don't know exactly. Uh, what features they're using, but it's absolutely possible that the system may have been using what we call periocular information, sort of information around the, the eye region. Um, but it's unlikely that they're doing something that is akin to iris recognition, just because the irises are such small portions of a face recognition type image. Um, but yes, so the answer is yes, it's probably using some periocular information. Yeah, and I'll just kind of add on to it. It's probably not using iris information. As John mentioned, iris use, is in the near infrared, right? And the features that are kind of discernible in that domain are very different than what would appear in the visible domain. So, you know, it's almost certainly using information here where the algorithms are saying when, when there's a mask, maybe I'm weighting these features differently than I would be if the person's not wearing a mask at all. Yeah, I think it, it was interesting that, you know, if you were going to do a study of a black box, seeing an algorithm as Arun pointed out um, to figure out what features it was using you know what you would do is essentially start masking different features out and running recognition performance and seeing when you know masking out the nose caused the the scores to go down with the covid pandemic and the application of masks we actually had this really interesting opportunity to sort of do a natural experiment there and say you know, can face recognition systems still work when we've removed facial information from uh, the lower part of the face. And you know, I think the results that Yevgeny presented sort of led us to the conclusion that it can. Uh, and so it, it must be using, again, not iris-like features, but ocular-like features. I think that's a very good assumption. So we, we have more questions. Um, here's the next one. Has there been or is there planned any research on genealogy diversity versus performance? In other words, do some demographics have greater genealogy diversity and therefore a greater difference in facial features than others that underpin some of the performance differences? So I'll take a part of that and, I'll, and I know that John will want to weigh in. So I, I, I talked about false non-match rates in, in, in my portion of the talk. And we believe that a lot of the errors in, 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 in failures to match can be tied to some of the acquisition uh, components of the system. So, for instance, I showed you that the predominance of the errors made in this scenario test is actually wasn't wasn't actually due to matching. Was with primarily due to image acquisition. And we think that at least one component that is responsible for that is the quality with the, which cameras can image different shades of the human skin. Um, and there's there's a number of uh, 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 pieces of research out there showing that you know, that really can affect the, the, the you could be overexposed or underexposed depending on exactly how that camera is set up. And we think that's really important. So there, I think it's this acquisition part and the way it interacts with the skin phenotype that's important. Well, when it comes to that other kinds of error, false matches, that's where I'll pass it over to John because I'm sure he'll have some thoughts. Yeah, this is a absolutely fantastic question. Um, there is almost certainly, something happening here that is more deep than, you know, simple race self-reporting. Um, and I'll, uh, the simple answer to your question is there has been some research on this, but not really at the genealogy level. So we know, for example, that twins who share uh, underlying DNA give face recognition a problem, right? That face recognition algorithms and humans will think that uh, twin A and twin B look very, very similar. We also know that taking it sort of one step further removed from genealogical identity. Um, parents and siblings also share facial, facial features. So there's a genealogy link that comes across in facial recognition. 
we don't know, and it's a really important in my mind in an area of research, where that sort of genealogical breakdown stops, where people stop looking similar because they happen to share genealogy. Uh, and so the planned part of your question is, is it's sorely needed. We don't have anything right now uh, to sort of work on this, although there has been a little bit of work in um, doing like reconstructions from DNA to face, um, but we haven't done any of that to date. Um, but needed, we need to, it's, it's a really good area to look into. Yeah, one, one thing I'll add here is that I think the question asked, could there be greater diversity of genealogy in some groups than others? And, and I think, you know, from from as a neuroscientist, you know, we all needed to recognize conspecifics. We needed, as John mentioned, we need to tell friend from foe. We need to tell apart the individuals in our in our in our groups and individuals outside our groups. I don't think that those evolutionary pressures have ever been different. Um, so it, it, it's not clear, you know, and we can all achieve these tasks well, uh, regardless and, you know, what our <laughs> origins are. So, so I think that really these, these are the questions that we raised on the false match side with face recognition is that, you know, people that are similar genetically to each other are going to like twins, uh, are going to be similar in their face characteristics. But I, I don't know of any evidence of differences in, in, in diversity for, for specific groups. Um, so we do have other questions. Um, the science here is potentially evolving past the public debate. And will these findings be published? And if so, where uh, they could be helpful? And I, I, so, so, so I think John mentioned um, that we have have publications on uh, available on the Biometrics and Identity Technology Center uh, website. Um, and uh, and a lot of this research is also published in in academic journals uh, as well. So I in, so I believe you could go to the by BITC website uh, today and download this technical paper series um, that John briefed. So that's available. Um, and the components of the demographically disaggregate analysis that I briefed earlier um are available in brief format but have not been explicitly published for the 2021 rally it is one of our goals to um to brief and to make this demographically disaggregated analysis of commercial technology available um as well uh, arun do, do you want to weigh in here yeah i'll also yeah. point out that we have uh so from our biometric and identity technology center center page you can also find a link to our mdtf page mdtf.org and we have a number of papers there that are linked as well. You know, there's this constant uh, balance that we're trying to strike about uh, putting out good content and material and analyses here, and also going through like peer reviewed processes, right? And peer review is not always a, um, a, a timely process. It, it can take a lot of time, and sometimes it's just because the editors are busy, right? So, so we are trying to make sure we are putting out information on a timely basis, that it's uh, informative and useful, um, but yeah, we, it has always been, it is also beneficial to get uh, peer review, but sometimes, and that's what we've almost exclusively done in the past. It's just that that process was just taking so long and it was preventing us from helping to get content out to some of the, the public forum. Because otherwise there's no, um, people send out misinformation via tweets in seconds. It's very hard for us to go through a peer review process and then put something out to contest that when our processes are so much longer. Uh, so we do go through the internal, so we do go through s and processes to review it before we publish it. Um, but anyway, so we're trying to do a combination of both so we can make sure better information is available to people who are, who need this information to help inform public policy and public debate on these topics. Uh, I think we have a couple more questions here. Yep. Uh, uh, so the next one here is. I sent it, I'm sorry. It's on, it's on the published link. I'll, I'll read okay, it. So go ahead, Arun, please. Uh, the other race effect. Um, has been in literature for a long time. Wouldn't a way of mitigating equitability be to have a more diverse training set? So I'll, I'll start with this one. Is what we should what, what we showed and uh, what John showed on his slides about face recognition is not the other race effect. The other race effect is it, it, it says that if I am raised in an environment where I'm exposed to people of a certain demographic group 
that I am better at discriminating faces that belong to that same demographic group. And usually it's my own demographic group. Uh, what John was talking about is that face recognition in general has a greater propensity to confuse people that match in race, gender and age to each other, um, which is a very different thing. And, and it's something that took a while to wrap our heads around because of this cognitive bias that we have that says, hey, faces are more similar to us perceptually. But that's because we have this neural circuitry that tells us so. Uh, we don't have this type of neural circuitry or intuition for iris recognition or fingerprint recognition. And in fact, these systems don't can make those same kind of demographic, uh, conf the demographic confusion matrix. Of those systems looks very different. John, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think so. This is actually a really um, <clears throat> clean case of where diverse training set certainly helps, but it doesn't solve this problem. So we, we hear a lot from uh, people that are in the face recognition space that, oh, if we only had a more diverse data set, a lot of these problems would disappear. And here, I think, um, is, a, is a great sort of counterexample. So imagine you're sort of training a face recognition system and you set the optimization parameters, right? You are telling the computer program what doing a good job looks like. And in most ways that these things are trained right now, it has two objectives. It needs to think pictures of me look like other pictures of me, they get high scores, and pictures of me and other people get low scores. And you sort of say, okay, computer program, neural net, accomplish these two things. And if you accomplish these two things, I have a working face recognition system. What this actually says is there's a third criteria. So even getting a more diverse data set wouldn't solve this problem. You need to add this third optimization parameter. And it's it's that the person who looks most like me shouldn't also share my demographic groups, shouldn't be a 30 year old Caucasian male. So it's a great example of where, yeah, diverse training set will help, but you then also need to make this recognition that you have to update your optimization steps uh, and add this new things. Uh, yeah. Short answer, yes, it would help. No, it doesn't solve this particular problem. Yep, and we have okay. one more. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Go you ahead. Guys, Good. Yeah, did you guys go over um, like some of the reasons why we're looking into this, like in particular, the whole thing about protected classes and trying to have equitable performance across? Yep, OK. Never yeah, mind. So, so we didn't we didn't go through it in detail, and I think it makes sense to do that now. Um, yeah, Ar Arun, so so protected groups came up a little bit earlier. And I wanted to point out a ramification. I don't think we put that slide into this uh, brief, but there's a ramification that 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 people need to consider about face recognition, making these more confusions between people of the same race, gender, and age. So, and, and these happen because if let's say I have a gallery of people who share my demographic characteristics, uh, everybody is a is let's say a white male of a certain age. Um, and if I am not in that gallery, but other people that look like me are, um, and I go to match against that gallery, then in general, if you have an accurate system, my likelihood of a match will be low, but that low likelihood of a match may still be higher against that gallery of white males than, um, than say, a, 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 an Asian female against that same gallery, right? So I would have a greater hazard of matching falsely to this gallery of white males and somebody else that doesn't share my demographics. And in many circumstances, that could be considered uh, you know, not desirable or unfair because if that gallery is something that you know, perhaps I don't wanna match to, um, it, it's somebody, maybe it's a list of people that would not be allowed to fly that day, uh, then I would have a greater sort of hazard of, of, of having that error occur. And, and with face recognition, that's, that, that could be something that we need to worry about. So I'll, I'll go through the last question here. We're, we're running up uh, on our time. And that last question is, have infrared systems been used in face recognition? And are those systems less prone to demographic effects? And, and I think the, the answer is yes. Um, and we've actually in the rally have had some systems that have used infrared light for their acquisition. Um, we did see some different demographic characteristics, but it's a very small sample. Most face recognition systems today um, that, that have participated in our testing have been um, visible spectrum uh, face acquisition systems looking at using 
typical RGB sensors. Um, but it is an open question of what would happen to these acquisition demographic effects if uh, infrared systems were used. So that's uh, that takes us through the end of the questions. Arun, I, I'll hand it off to you. Yeah, thank you so much. So, um, uh, Evgeny and John, thank you so much for doing the call, uh, for doing for, for for sharing the webinar, uh, and thanks to all the participants who who joined us this afternoon to learn more about some of our research and and learn some of the work that we're doing. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, you know, within the Biometric Identity Technology Center, uh, you can always get me on Teams or, or email. Uh, in fact, I think I just saw a couple emails come through, so I'm happy to help follow up and and help answer questions and and share any information uh, as it's relevant. So, uh, yeah, thanks again, and uh, please please keep in touch.